grace flowing from his side. Yeah. They pierced his body and his blood was shed. And in that moment, Satan and his many imps and demons felt as though victory was won because the blood was flowing from his side, but they forgot the power yes. that's in the blood. Amen. Amen. Yes, there's power in the blood. The enemy saw victory and defeat for us, but the world saw grace flowing from his side. Yes, yes. We owed a debt that we could not pay, yet he paid a debt that he did not owe. Amen. For each and every one of us. Each one of us. Power in the blood. Thank you, God. They hung him high and stretched him wide for the world to mock and ridicule and all these many things, you know, but we serve the God of the ninth hour. Yes. That when all hope is lost and all possibilities are gone, that's when he begins to work. See, they forgot that he said how to reach the masses, men of every birth. For the answer, Jesus is the key. He said, if I, if I be lifted up from the earth, I'll draw all men, draw unto, all me. men unto me. He hung high, but he drew us in. Yes, thank you. Mocked and ridiculed, but we found grace. Yes, thank Amen. you, Jesus. Amen. Amen. For that, we say thank you. I thank you thank all for you joining God. us today as we're here in this last month of 2023. Amen. Yes. What a year 2023 has been for each and every one of us. Amen. Amen. I won't prolong the time and uh, we're going to let the Lord have his way. While we're standing, we're going to go ahead and have our scripture reading. Today, we're coming from the book of Exodus, chapter 15. Verses 1 through 20. Amen. Very familiar passage of scripture, and it reads as follows. I'll be reading from the NIV. Then Moses and the Israelites sang this song to the Lord. I will sing to the Lord, for he is highly exalted. Both horse and driver, he is hurled into the sea. The Lord is my strength and my defense. He has become my salvation. He is my God. And I will praise him, my father's God, and I will exalt him. The Lord is a warrior. The Lord is his name. Pharaoh's chariots and his army he has hurled into the sea. The best of Pharaoh's officers are drowned in the Red Sea. The deep waters have covered them. They sank to the depths like a stone. Your right hand, Lord, was majestic in power. Your right hand, Lord, shattered the enemy. In the greatness of your majesty, you threw down those who opposed you. You unleashed your burning anger. It consumed them like stubble. By the blast of your nostrils, the water piled up. The surging water stood up like a wall, and the deep waters congealed in the heart of the sea. The enemy boasted, I will pursue. I will overtake them. I will divide the spoils. I will gorge myself on them. I will draw my sword, and my hand will destroy them. But you blew your breath, and the sea covered them. Mm -hmm. They sank like lead in the mighty waters. Who among the gods is like you, Lord? Who is like you, majestic in holiness, awesome in glory, working wonders? You stretch out your right hand, and the earth swallows your enemies. In your failing love, you will lead the people you have redeemed. In your strength, you will guide them to your holy dwelling. The nations will hear and tremble. Anguish will grip the people of Philistia. The chiefs of Edom will be terrified. The leaders of Moab will be seized with trembling. The people of Canaan will melt away. Terror and dread will fall on them by the power of your arm. They will be as still as a stone until your people pass by, Lord. Until the people you bought pass by. Yes. You will bring them in and plant them on the mountain of your inheritance, the place, Lord, you made your dwelling, the sanctuary, Lord, your hands established. Mm -hmm. The Lord reigns forever and ever. Yes. When Pharaoh's horses, chariots, and horsemen went into the sea, the Lord brought the waters of the sea back over them. But the Israelites crossed through the sea on dry ground. Mm -hmm. Then Miriam, the prophet, Aaron's sister took a temple in her hand, and all the women followed her with timbrels and dancing. Miriam sang to them, Sing to the Lord, for he is highly exalted, both horse and driver, he is hurled into the sea. Yes. There is power in your praise. Yes. 
Father God, we thank you, Lord, for today. We thank you, Heavenly Father, for this, the opportunity to come together and share your word, Heavenly Father, on this day, Heavenly Father. The word has been studied, Heavenly Father, but Lord, you speak to these, your people, Heavenly Father. You know what it is, Father, that we stand in need of on this day, Heavenly Father. And we trust you right now, Heavenly Father, that you're going to spend the word, Heavenly Father, that will be an encouragement, Heavenly Father, to these under the sound of my voice, yes, Heavenly Father. We trust you right now, Heavenly Father, that you're going to send the word, Heavenly Father, that will be a light to our feet, Father, and a light unto our path, Father. We trust you right now, Father, that you're going to send the word, Heavenly Father, that will equip us, Lord, for the days yet to come, Heavenly Father. Somebody left a problem at home on this morning, Heavenly Father, but they pressed their way, Heavenly Father, to the house of the Lord, Heavenly Father, to hear what thus said the Lord. So Holy Spirit, speak to these, your people, Heavenly Father. Lead us, guide us, and protect us, Lord, as only you can. In Jesus' name we pray. Jesus Amen. Name. Amen. You may be seated. There is power in your prayers. As I studied and prepared for today, there were so many thoughts that went through my mind. Uh, something that I want you all to understand on today. We have to understand, we've been talking about lots of things. We discussed the, the Lord's Prayer. And we understood the petitions that were presented to us in the Lord's Prayer. And we understood how to personalize these things and take the authority that is given to us through the Lord's Prayer. We went a little further and we studied and we learned that each and every one of us has a message that we have been employed by the Father to share with this dying world. We understand now that it doesn't matter where we come from. It doesn't matter the circumstance that we went through, but we all have a message. We study the message. We study the petitions. We understand that we have a voice. And now today, we're going to understand that there is power in our praise. Now, when I say there is power in your praise, your mind could go to many different places. You may say to yourself, power in my praise, but I'm not a praise and worship leader. How is there power in my praise? I'm just a lay person that comes and sits and enjoys what is being given. But I want you to understand there is power mm -hmm. in your praise. We sing the songs all the time. Zion is calling us to a higher place of praise. And we say that he desires to abide in the praises of his people. So we lift our hands and we lift our voice. And we offer up the praise unto his name because there is power in your praise. Now, if we know that there is power in our praise, the enemy also knows yes. there is power in, in your praise. Yes. So what the enemy is going to do, the enemy is going to be on his job and the enemy is going to be about his business. And the enemy is going to do his best to convince you that there is no power in your praise. The enemy is going to do his best to make you feel as though the situation and circumstances you're going through prohibits you from having a praise. But there is power in your praise. Power. Amen. Now today, as I, I stand before you, my mind goes to many places. I think about the Capers family and how our, our sister Dell and sister May, they laid their sister to rest on yesterday. And I think about the Rivers family and how they're laying their mother, sister Mary Ann, to rest tomorrow. And all these thoughts are crossing my mind. And you know, from the natural side, we may look at this and the world may want us to think that affliction found a victory. But I stand before you today to let you know that your praise has power. And the affliction has no victory. When I think no about victory. Sister Mary Ann and all that she endured and all that she went through, Miss Mary Ann was my Miriam. She was a person of encouragement. She was a person of support. She was a person that had a positive outlook because there is power in your praise. The yes. first point that I want to leave with you today is I want you to remember that the enemy may be tormenting you, but the sea is coming. The enemy is on each and every one of our paths. The enemy is on his job. The enemy is doing exactly what he was sent to do. Steal, kill, and destroy. Amen. He doesn't take a day off. That's right. He works overtime. He gets along with his co-workers. The only people that can't seem to get along and come together 
are the ones that call themselves Christian. Amen. We let denomination separate us. We let age separate us. We let financial status separate us. We let opinions separate us. But the enemy comes together and they all come to That's steal, right. kill, and destroy. Yes. You want to get them in the morning and I think it's better to get them at night. Well, you go for morning and I'll come for night. But Christians come together. If we can't worship at 10 o'clock, I ain't going in. If they're going to wear pants, I ain't showing up. And if they're not singing like this, I'm not supporting. They always asking for money and I'm not giving. But the enemy me yeah. is together That's and the right. enemy yeah. is coming. Yeah. The enemy says, oh, you want to get the Pentecostals and I'll get the Baptists? That's fine. You get yours and I'll get mine. They're coming for all of us. The yeah. enemy is tormenting us. But the yes. word today, let us know, let him torment you now because the sea is coming. Yes. It says, the yes. enemy boasted, I will pursue, I will overtake them, I will divide the spoils, I will gorge myself on them, I will draw my sword, and my hand will destroy them. Mm -hmm. The enemy wants you to be scared. Yes. The enemy wants you to be fearful. Mm -hmm. The enemy wants you to be worried. The enemy wants you to be doubtful. Do you understand that some of the afflictions that we carry don't even belong to us? Yeah. These are the problems of our parents and our yeah. grandparents yeah. and the yeah. generations before. But nobody's been bold enough to stand and say, it stops with me. That's but you right. need to tell the enemy today, you on my back right now, but the sea is coming. The sea is coming. Don't let your enemy get so big that you forget that your God is bigger. Amen. Your God is bigger. Yes. Your God is stronger. Your God is awesome in his power. Your eyes may see a watery dead end. They gave the diagnosis and said that it was terminal. The bank said you'll never get the loan. You done reached that age where they say children are not in your future. Your kids ain't never got it together. Every time you turn around, there's another problem. Your eyes see the watery dead end. But you got to understand something. God sees a tribe. Yes, yes, you see, the yes. God that we serve, what he does is he lets the enemy stay on your back because he wants the enemy to poke out his chest. He wants the enemy to think they got you. He wants the enemy to ride you so long that the enemy forgets about the power of the one that you serve. Jesus. See, we are an instant generation. Yes. We feel as though if I call on Jesus today and right now and say, Lord, help me, I should be able to turn around and everything is already worked out. That's not the kind of God we serve. You see, everybody today wants instant grits. Put a half a cup of water in it and pop it in the microwave for two or three minutes and they're ready to sit down and eat. But see, Grandma came from the day of that Quaker grits where you got to put it on the stove and let it simmer and stir for a That's little while right. to get it ready. Because yeah. everything you ask for can't be instantly given to you because if you could get it in an instant, you would not appreciate it. That's Tell right. your enemy the sea is coming. Now, I'm not telling you something that I read for myself to make me feel better and to make you feel better. I'm telling you something that I've come to know for myself. You see, there was a day when, before the church even got started, on the, the eve of the church beginning to begin in August that year, I received a check in the mail from Miss Mary Ann. Mm -hmm. She wasn't a member at Cornerstone. She had never come to a service in Somerville, but she decided to send a love offering to the church. Mm -hmm. Now, in the midst of the day when I received the love offering from Miss Mary Ann, my heart was overjoyed at the mailbox because she thought so much of us to send this donation to a place that she had not attended. But inside my house, there was a little bit of a storm going on. There was a separation about to come about yes. in my marriage on the eve of the great thing that God called me to do. Let me tell you what I was feeling on the inside. In those very moments at the mailbox, here's a sign of happiness and joy. The ministry's about to start. People are pouring into the ministry and they haven't even come into the church just yet. They haven't heard me preach in Cornerstone. They haven't read the bylaws, but it did not matter. She chose to pour into the ministry, step back into the threshold of my house, and all kinds of crazy breaks loose. Yes. Amen. Happy at the mailbox, mm -hmm. 
distraught in the place this should be my place of rest. And then I noticed she sent the check and the check was blank. She signed the check and didn't write anything on the check but Cornerstone. So I went into the office and I decided to give her a call and I took a few minutes to disguise my voice and pretend to be happy and thankful because that's what the pastor should portray to this person. She don't need to know what's going on. And we got on the phone and we started talking and something came over me that said on that day, you know what? You just need to be real with this lady. Amen. You can hide it if you want to, but it'll be better if she heard it from you before she heard it in the street. Maybe this was God's way of letting her not fill in the check so she, I could tell her what's going on and she could say, well, baby, tear that check up. I told her the situation that was going on in my life. I told her the fear that I felt in that moment. I told her how heavy and downtrodden my heart was at that time. As a woman that had been married all the years that I've known her, as the woman that had birthed these children and made a family and carried out the will of God as has been aligned in the scripture, here I am calling myself a leader and telling her about a defeat before the situation even begins. But see, Miss Mary Ann decided on that day not to be Mary Ann, the parishioner, but she decided to be my Miriam, the prize. I've always known Miss Mary Ann to have a beautiful voice to sing at Bethlehem all my life growing up. She led the choir and she sang and she sang and she sang. And then life gave her an affliction and the situation brought about a little bit of change. And now Miss Mary Ann didn't sing a song of praise to me on that day, but Miss Mary Ann gave me words of encouragement. You see, Miss Mary Ann told me, son, if God called you to do this, you do what God called you to do, baby. Don't you worry about what people are going to have to say. Don't you worry about who's going to tell you that God ain't called you. She said, I sent you this money, but I'm going to support you every opportunity and every chance that I get. She gave me an encouraging prayer. Now, we have to remember that God desires to abide in the praises of his people. Now, I could have had a pity party for myself on that day. I could have sent out some emails and said, y'all, the church ain't coming. I could have decided just to fall off the face of the earth and never let anybody find me. But because of the Miriam in my life, I decided to continue on and press on it. Then verse 10 tells us, but he blew your breath. And the sea covered them, and they sank like lead in the mighty water. See, when God speaks to your situation, change comes about. When God speaks to your situation, the supernatural seems to become natural. When God speaks to your situation, the crooked paths become straight. You see, I could have called some friends of mine, and the outcome might have been a little different, but God sent a Miriam in my life so she could prophesy to me from Hampton County about a ministry that she had never set foot in. While she is dealing with an affliction in her body, she didn't concern herself with her problems. She concerned herself with my situation and my circumstance, and she was a vessel for the Lord. Now, after our conversation, I felt a little better. You see, she didn't judge me. She didn't criticize me. She didn't critique the ministry. She told me to hold my head high. You see, she called in on Monday night prayer time. She's not a tech-savvy woman, but she found a way to get on, talk through the text, and she sent me a message afterwards and let me know that she enjoyed it. She sent me a text message and tell me to be encouraged. So I stand before you today to tell you, let your problems know that the sea is coming. Let your situation know that the sea is coming. Press on, baby, just a little while longer. Press on, brother, just a little while longer. Don't look at what's beside you and don't worry about what's behind you, but fixate on your eyes on that which is before you. Your eyes are going to tell you it's the watery dead end, but your faith is going to show you a dry superhighway. Hold on, sister, 
Sinitra, there's a dry day coming. Hold on, Sister Sinitra, he heard your cry. Hold on, Mother Haywood, God has not forgotten. Hold on, Miss Jeanette, God is still answering prayers. You let your problems know the sea is coming. There's no need to worry. And there's no need to fret because there's victory on the other side of this. Yes, the second point yes, yes. that I want to leave with you today is take up your cross in preparation for your crown. We get to the point in our lives where we decide that, you know, we want the benefits, but we don't want to endure the process to get to the benefits. We think if we sign up to be Christians and we give our right hand of fellowship and we do these great things that when we walk out of the church, everything is going to be made well because we gave our life to God and now God is about to fix it instantaneously. That is not how it works. How do we know that's not how it works? Because we sing the song all the time. Must Jesus bear the cross alone and all the world go free? No, there's a cross for everyone and there is a cross for me. You got to carry that cross in preparation for your crown. And the way you carry that cross is what's going to help you make it to your crown. You see, Miss Mary Ann was my Miriam and she was also my nightingale. Let me tell you something about the nightingale. The nightingale is a beautiful bird that sings its best songs in the midst of the midnight hour. When all, now we hear the mockingbirds and we hear the blue jays and every time we hear them, the sun is out and it's a beautiful day and you can look around and you can find them. But now deep in the midnight hour, there comes a beautiful sound out of the midst of the darkness and that sound is the nightingale. It don't sing during the daytime. It don't sing when the crowd is around. It don't sing when everybody is watching. But while everybody is slumbering and sleeping and while some can't get the sleep because the tears, their pillows are wet with tears and while their minds are everywhere but on rest, the nightingale belts out its most beautiful song in the dead of the night. To let you know that don't worry about the situation that you're going through because in the midst of your darkness, God will send you peace. Yes, yes. She had a struggle. She had a situation. And she had a circumstance. But she still sang God's goodness in the midst of what she was going through. Yes, you see, the yes. nightingale sings his most beautiful song in the dead of the night. And the thing about the nightingale, too, is birds migrate by season. You know, as it starts to get cold, they move from here to there, and they do this and they do that. But the thing about the nightingale, the nightingale is usually the first bird of season to migrate. It moves before the other birds move. Before the ministry was started, the nightingale had come into my life. Before I preached the first sermon at Cornerstone, my nightingale was already present in my life. Why did she come so early? Because she had to encourage me in my midnight hour. She didn't worry about her pain. And she didn't worry about her affliction. And she didn't worry about what she was going through. She just said, I want to be a support. And let me remind you of God in his goodness. Your nightingale is coming to your situation and your nightingale will be there before the circumstance gets rough. Look and listen for your nightingale. Now you see, the nightingale nests on the ground and not in the trees. A beautiful bird with a beautiful song. You would think that he would build his nest high in the tree and in the cleft and in the rocks to make it hard for the predators to get to. But they build their nest right there on the ground and in the open. Perfect target for their predators. Perfect target for anyone. And I'm sure the predators realize that the bird is going to sing in the middle of the night. But how hard will it be to find that bird in the midst of the night hour? But God places the nightingale in plain sight so that you and I can see them. You don't got to search all around to find where they are. You don't got to look at the trees and wonder if they're over here or over there. But they're right here in the midst of us because they're taking up their cross in preparation for their crown. 
You see, they don't pretend about infirmities and situations. They let you see everything that they're going through because they understand that while they carry this cross, it's preparation for the crown that's on the other side. Amen. Mockingbirds can sing and parrots can remember and all these things, but the nightingale, one single bird, can have a repertoire of over 1,000 sounds. Mm -hmm. You see, because they studied. Your nightingale will study the word of God. And your nightingale will bask in God's presence. And your nightingale will spend time with the Father. So that when you come to your nightingale, it can sing a beautiful song to you and bring things back to your memory that you may have forgotten. But the nightingale doesn't forget because it's got it tapped away inside of the, the crevices of their hearts and the crevices of your mind. They're going to take up their cross in preparation for their crown. Now you can look at them and see the situation and you can look at them and see the circumstance. When we went and we visited with her for the last time, my heart was a little heavy because I didn't know what God was going to do. But then I entered the room and in my heart, I could just hear her singing because I know what I saw before me, but I know what I heard and I felt in my heart because the same way that she was a nightingale for me, what I saw before me was a person that had made preparation with her cross for her crown. She never complained about the pain in her body. She never complained about the visits to the doctor, but she always proclaimed God in his goodness and his grace. Find your nightingale. Carry your cross in preparation for your crown. You can't get the crown if you don't endure the cross. Ain't no way you can't go around it. You can't jump over it. Your parents can't will you into it. Your last name ain't gonna cut it. Your good looks ain't gonna get it. Your tithe you gave to the church make no difference. Carry your cross if you want to receive your crown. If the God does, if Jesus could leave the realm of majesty to come here and sup with us and walk with us and feel what we went through, who are we to not want to carry our own cross? He did it for us, and he didn't have to do it. He did it for us, and it wasn't even his cause. It wasn't even his wrong, but he did it for us. Carry your cross in preparation for your crown. Now, the third and final point that I want to leave with you today is I don't want you to be a Martha in your situation, but I want you to be a Miriam in your situation. Now, what do I mean, don't be a Martha but be a Miriam. See, when Jesus and Lazarus arrived at Bethany after he had raised them from the dead, Martha, Lazarus' sister, she went on about her household chores and her business. You see, she didn't turn the oven off to give God praise in that moment. She didn't put down her broom to give God praise. She didn't stop spraying air freshener to give God praise. She was so tunnel vision on what she had to do and making preparations that the blessing that she wanted was right there before her, but she continued on about her work. Do not be a Martha in your situation. You need to be a Miriam. What did Miriam do when they were going and making their way toward the Red Sea and they were doing their best to find their way to freedom? Miriam, the prophetess, the one who had encouraged Aaron and the one who had encouraged Moses. Now, I know and you all know that there's this crowd of people and everybody following Moses and half of them really don't want to follow him anyway because they don't believe in what he's doing. Some of them would have said, leave me in bondage because at least I know I got a place to stay. Leave me in bondage because at least I know I got something to eat. Leave me in bondage because it's better here than what I don't know on the outside. But y'all said, follow Moses. And look right here. We done follow Moses and the Red Sea is before us and Pharaoh is behind us. What are we going to do? I'm sure they were mumbling. I'm sure they were complaining. I'm sure they were mad at one another. And maybe even Moses was looking like, sister, we said we were going to do this and it's not working out. But instantly, God showed up 
on the scene. And God took the watery dead in and he parted the sea right there before him. And see, we serve the God of exceeding abundance, which means he does more than you can ask for. He does more than you can think. Now, God could have took the people and just transported them to the other side. God could have took his time and made a divide so that Pharaoh couldn't get to him. But God let the oppressor get so close to them and then he opened up the way for them. But when I read it in the scripture, it doesn't tell me that they had to step through mud and people started losing their shoes and they were worried about the old people that were crippled and the babies and all this. It tells me they stepped through on dry land to the other side because that's the kind of God that we serve. If God is going to give you a way out of the situation, yeah. you don't got to worry about it half doing it. That's if God right. is going to give you a way out of the situation, you don't got to worry about if it's going to work out. If God is going to give you a way out of the situation, all you got to do is trust him. Trust, yeah. him. trust in the Lord with all thy heart. Him. Lean not to thine own understanding, yes. but in all your ways acknowledge him, and he will direct your path. My understanding would have told me there's no way they're going to walk through the bottom of a sea on dry ground. That's what my understanding would have said. But my faith says if God spoke it, he can do it. Yes. The scripture let us know that he breathed on Pharaoh and gave him the victory. He didn't even have to come down and hold the water back with his hands. He breathed, and there was the answer. So if his breath could hold back the sea for them to cross through on the other side, what is your situation and affliction for our God to handle? Who wouldn't serve a God yes, like yes, this? Yes. Now, what did Miriam do in this instance? They made it through to the other side. Miriam didn't take time to say, y'all see my brother? And y'all see what my brother did? Miriam didn't take time to say, all of y'all over there in the corner that was doubting my brother, y'all need to apologize right now. That's not what she did. Miriam didn't say, lift up Moses before the people so they can see what God did through our family. That's all people that did this. That's not what Miriam did. As soon as they made it, to the other yes, side. Yes, Miriam yes, grabbed yes, her temporal yes. and she gave God a praise. Don't you let God take you through the situation and you make God wait on the praise that's that right. you do that's that's due to right. him. Don't you let God that's work it right. out for you and you say you'll praise him on Sunday. Yes. Don't you let God yes. make a way for you yes. and you forget to yes. give him the praise. That's Don't you right. let God open a door that was closed and you forget to give yes. God a praise. Get yes. your temporal in your hand yes. and give God the praise yes. that is due to him. You desire to abide yes. in the praises of your Thank people. You, give Thank God you. his praise. Yes. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you. Remember Hallelujah. Miriam. Yes. Remember Miss Mary Ann. Yes. The affliction was on her body. It had to be hard. It had to be tough. Yes. But she gave God praise. She gave God what was due to him. She carried a cross so she could get a crown. Do not forget, Don't forget to carry your cross. Amen. Thank you, God. Do not forget to give God Jesus, his praise. Hallelujah. Do not forget what he's done for those in the past. Yes. Do not doubt that he can't do it for you. Do not be the tunnel vision Martha, but be the Miriam and give God his praise. Give Amen. it to him. Give, give God what's due to him. Yes, give it to him. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. He desires to abide. Thank you, Jesus. In the praises of his people. Hallelujah. Thank he you, desires Jesus. to abide mm -hmm. in the praises of his people. Yes, God. He desires to abide he in the praises abide. of his people. Thank you, Jesus. Are you giving him his praise today? Hallelujah. I know the situation looks tough. I understand. Mm -hmm. I face them myself. Mm -hmm. Not telling you what I don't know. I'm going to tell you what I'm often reminded of. Yes, God. If God brought you to it, yes. God can and will mm -hmm. take you through. Mm -hmm. I tell you what I'm reminded of. He didn't let Moses and the people drown. Mm -hmm. He took them through to the other side. I'll tell you what I'm reminded of. He'll send a Miriam in your life. To give you some encouragement. Yes. I'll tell you what I'm reminded of. He'll send a nightingale in your darkest hour to sing a song of praise. I'll tell you what I'm reminded of. If you carry your cross, he will give you a crown. I'll tell you what I'm reminded of. 
The enemy is on your back, but the sea is coming. There is power in your praise. Stand on your feet. We thank God for his work on today. We thank God for the opportunity to honor Sister Mary Ann on today. We thank God for all those that are here under the sound of my voice. Now, I talk about it fairly often, lab and lecture. As we go through school, the courses that I hated the most were courses that had lab and lecture because we would sit there and lecture and listen to the professor go on and on and on and on and on. And, but that wasn't the end. You then had to go to lab on another day and you had to apply those principles that you were taught in lecture. They didn't care what kind of notes you took in lecture. He didn't care that you showed up for every lecture session. What he cared about was how you, how you took what you learned in lecture and you applied it in lab. That's where your grade came from. Your grade didn't come from being present, but your grade came from application. And that's the same way it works in this Christian life. God ain't given us credit for perfect attendance on Sunday morning. God has given us credit for our application in lab. Where do we find ourselves in lab? In the highways and the byways. Where do we find ourselves in lab in our homes when we're dealing with our spouses? Where do we find ourselves in lab on the job when they're getting on our nerves? Where do we find ourselves in lab when we think no one is looking yes. and we have a decision to make? Thank you, God. So as we prepare today for lab, the doors of the church are open. 